how neural circuits are constructed. Just before he starts, we were just chatting beforehand. I asked Thomas the key question, if you win a Nobel Prize, can you then tell peer reviewers on grants that you probably know what you're doing? And he tells me, no, you still have to have that argument. I've also introduced him to the Australian tradition, which I encourage you to do, that we like to speak frankly and critically. And it turns out so does Thomas. So if you have questions and comments and things you'd like to raise, please use the Q&A function. And at the end, we'll get the chance to actually ask Thomas for his straightforward opinion. And I'm pretty sure we'll get a straightforward answer. So welcome, Thomas. And thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon here and this evening in California. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah. <laughs> you're live. You're live and you're speaking. Good. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. It's evening here in California. It's amazing how technology has changed our lives. So it is a pleasure for me and an honor to present my work to you here today. I will provide you with a talk that illustrates one of the key questions we are trying to address in our labs right now. And I hope that I'll, what I will tell you will be interesting to you. So let me try to share my screen and hope that this will work. Okay. Okay, screen sharing failed. Okay. Ah. <clears throat> okay, let me try again. Let's see. Please try again later. So I'll just ask our technical person, Harrison, have we transferred permission to Thomas? Yes, all permissions granted. Um, would you like to try one more time, Thomas? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it's fine. Let's do it again. Ah, that is encouraging. Yes, we can see that. Okay. <clears throat> do you see, what do you see? <laughs> we're seeing both. We're seeing a very light br br <laughs> brain picture on the left and we're seeing the next slide of a piece of that, human tissue okay now how do we yeah normally what happens i've given a lot of these virtual talks is that you should only see the left picture so up, up, up the top left you can see um the third button along says swap displays okay we'll try that one how about this one good to go perfect good, good to go okay that sounds terrific Okay, so this is my revised title Towards the Molecular Logic of Synapse Formation, How Latrophilins Construct Neural Circuits. I use this revised title because it already tells you that I'm going to talk about just one particular class of molecules in my discussion with you today. And I will explain this in the very beginning why. Let me start with some introduction. As you all know, the brain is incredibly interesting. After all, we all have one. Um, and it is incredibly um, complex, composed of trillions and trillions of neurons, each of which is connected to other neurons by thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of synapses. When you compare the brain to the complexity of the genome, it is stunning how much simpler the genome at least appears to be. And we all know how difficult it has been to understand the genome, how much complexity is encoded in this two-dimensional uh, nucleotide series. So the three-dimensional brain with its enormous connections provides a true challenge for us to understand. And it's thus not surprising that neuroscientists often argue about what's the best way to understand it and who does the best work in understanding it. I won't settle that argument today. I will never settle it, in fact. 
But there's a concept that is shared among all neuroscientists, and that is the concept of the neural circuit. And this concept is illustrated in this slide here, which shows a microcircuit schematically in the middle of the slide and above it an electron micrograph of a synapse which connects neurons into circuits. What you can see from this microcircuit is that the pyramidal neuron on the left connects via synapses to both a pyramidal neuron on the right, both in blue, and to a red interneuron, which in turn provides feed forward inhibition onto the right pyramidal neuron. A circuit like this is typical, but there's obviously many variations of circuits. They're created by synapses that connect these neurons to each other and that process the information that they transfer. Synapses not only serve as way stations of information transfer, but they actually change the information while they transfer it thereby determining the input-output relations of a circuit. Our lab's major objective at this point is to identify the molecular rules that determine synapse formation and specification, that basically tell the brain where to form synapses, which two neurons to connect, and what properties the resulting synaptic connections are supposed to have. Our starting point is the proposition that synapses, as illustrated here again in the electron micrograph of the synapse, are intercellular junctions between two cells. At this junction, they are connected with each other such that they form a, a very precise alignment. The two sides of the junctions are different in that the presynaptic side has synaptic vesicles containing neurotransmitters. The postsynaptic side has receptors that recognize the neurotransmitters. The way this junction assembles most likely involves bidirectional signaling via transsynaptic cell adhesion molecules, as illustrated here with this red arrow. These adhesion molecules bind the two sides together, but they more importantly mediate signaling between the two sides. This type of bidirectional signaling at synapses is thought to actually create the synapse in the first place to organize the presynaptic specialization, the active zone and vesicles and so on, and to recruit and regulate the postsynaptic receptors. Understanding this signaling thus is key to understanding how synapses are built. And this is crucial not only for understanding the brain in health, but it is also crucial for understanding diseases because both neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases seem to occur in a large extent at synapses and seem to initiate via dysfunction of synapses. So we and others have been looking for synaptic adhesion molecules that may be instrumental in mediating this bidirectional signaling. And not surprisingly, many such molecules have been described. What you see here in this slide is a schematic overview of some of these molecules, extremely schematic in fact. The left side is, shows the presynaptic side, the right the postsynaptic side, the yellow is the synaptic cleft. And you can see that there is quite a number of them, especially postsynaptically. Indeed, at this point, many of these molecules are more candidate than assured. And we don't know actually which ones are important and which ones are not. So one of our goals has been to try to sort out which of these molecules actually do perform important functions in making synapses. And then addressing this problem, we have 
pursued an interdisciplinary approach that tries to look both at actual structures at the atomic level as well as it functions as assayed, for example, by electrophysiology or by behavioral studies of genetically manipulated animals. I'm not going to tell you today about the entire program because that would be too long and I think also kind of boring. The fact is that we are at this point only at the beginning of an understanding. Instead, I want to focus on just one particular family of proteins. And the reason I want to focus on these proteins called latrofilins is that they have turned out to be instrumental in making a subset of synapses. They're essential for the formation of a subset of synapses and provide, in my view, the first opportunity ever to really try to dissect how synapses are made. We have also studied some of the other molecules that are shown here extensively, for example, neurexins. I'm not going to talk about neurexins that are kind of hub molecules, as you can see here, even though they are intimately involved in a number of neuropsychiatric disorders, because time doesn't allow this. Just suffice it to say that the neurexins, as opposed to the latrofilins, are actually required for endowing synapses with specific properties, not with making synapses. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm first going to tell you about the basic observations that led us to postulate how latrofilins, that led us to postulate that latrofilins control the formation and specificity of synapses. I am then going to tell you two different stories, projects, that illustrate how latrofilins work in creating synapses and that I hope will inspire you with sort of the idea that latrofilins are, as I'll explain in a minute, GPCRs, but special GPCRs that basically perform a specialized GPCR function for making synapses. And this will become much clearer during the, hopefully, during the process of this talk. So let me start at telling you about the starting up some observations showing that latrofilins control synapse formation and specificity. And as I already mentioned, latrofilins are GPCRs, but they're special GPCRs, they're so-called adhesion GPCRs. Adhesion GPCRs are illustrated schematically here on the example actually of the latrofilins. Adhesion GPCRs are designed of very large extracellular domains that contain a lot of putative ligand binding domains as shown here on top. They then include a canonical set of two domains that define adhesion GPCRs as a class, a so-called gain domain and the typical GPCR7 transmembrane region domain. At the C-terminus, they usually have very long cytoplasmic sequences. And all of this has been worked not by our lab, but by many other labs that are shown here at the bottom. Now, when you look at what actually defines an adhesion GPCR, it's not the GPCR domain. That just makes it a GPCR, but hundreds of other GPCRs have similar GMR domains. What defines an adhesion GPCR is the so-called gain domain, a domain that we defined some years ago when we structurally identified this as an autonomously folded domain using a crystal structure. The gain domain, as it turns out, is an autoproteolysis domain. It's a domain that mediates an autoproteolytic cleavage of a sequence within the domain. And it is the defining feature, as I already mentioned, of all adhesion GPCRs. What this slide shows is the atomic structure of the gain domain for latrofilin 1 that we determined in collaboration with Axel Brüngers lab in 2011. You can see that this domain has two subdomains, a helical yellow domain and a beta strand 
mostly better strand um, pink domain, which is C-terminal. And what you can see here is that the cleavage side actually happens right in the middle of the pink domain, better strand domain, and that the better strand that is being cleaved and terminal off remains stuck like a finger in a pocket after cleavage. So the domain after the autoproteolysis remains attached to each other. However, with force, it can be separated. And indeed, work from many labs, not ours, but others, has suggested plausibly and intriguingly that what happens is that adhesion GPCRs are activated by pulling off by a ligand the gain domain from its peptide so that the peptide sticks out and then functions as an tethered agonist that basically acts on the, its receptor itself. A very interesting idea. This is the overall domain of adhesion, uh, overall design of adhesion GPCRs. In the case of latrophilins, they have classical adhesion GPCRs, they have all these things. And as ligand, as ligand binding domains that are specific for latrophilins, they have a lectin like domain at the end terminus, followed by an olfactomedin like domain that is the next one in here. And because they have multiple domains, <coughs> latrophilins bind to multiple transsynaptic ligands. Specifically, they bind to a class of molecules called tenuants, which are evolutionarily conserved large, very large adhesion molecules, and to floats, which are also evolutionarily conserved, just like latrophilins, but a much smaller loosen rich repeat proteins. And by binding to these proteins, they form adhesions between cells, so they are truly trans interactions that can couple two sides to each other. With this design, latrophilins are poised to be classical adhesion GPCRs that adhere or mediate adhesion between cells. The adhesion itself is not sufficient to remove the gain domain from the rest of the molecule, so they stay adherent. And because they have a GPCR domain, they are also poised to be involved in signaling. What I haven't mentioned, but maybe should have, is that latrophilins were actually discovered and purified by two former postdocs of my laboratory, Sasha Petrenko and Yuri Oshkariev, in their own labs more than 20 years ago, because they bound to alpha latrotoxin, which is a presynaptically acting toxin from the black widow spider vena. Because of their binding to alpha latrotoxin, they were named latrophilins, makes sense, right? And suggested to have a synaptic role. But it remained unclear what they actually do. We cloned all of the three latrophilins more than 20 years ago, and we confirmed that they indeed have interesting properties such as latrotoxin binding. Confirming furthermore, or basically feeling confident that they must have something to do with synapses. But until we obtained conditional knockout mice, we found it very difficult to study these molecules. So we used conditional knockout mice in recent years to actually try to identify what do these proteins do. And we started with the idea that they would be presynaptic molecules that do some kind of presynaptic GPCR signaling. However, to our surprise, we found that when we deleted them conditionally and isolated neurons postsynaptically, we got a major phenotype. What you see here in this image is a number of neurons all characterized by a red nucleus that is stained for the neuronal marker neuron. One of the neurons is transfected with Cre or as a control, delta Cre, mutant Cre recombinase, and is in green, and you can see all the dendritic arborization of that neuron. 
This enables us to analyze by sparse transfection in a culture what happens if you postsynaptically delete, in this case, lateral finance. When we did this in this experiment, and we analyzed synapse numbers, synaptic transmission, and spine numbers, we observed that the sparse postsynaptic deletion of lateral finance had a major phenotype. I'm only showing you here the spine phenotype. That spine phenotype consisted in a massive reduction of the number of spines on a dendroid, about 40 to 50% reduction. This was a surprise to us and actually to everybody else. Some people may still not believe it, <laughs> that it was a postsynaptic deletion. It was in fact the most severe synapse loss knockout phenotype we have observed in analyzing, I don't know, 30, 40 knockout mice over the, our careers, suggesting that latrophilin has a major function in synapses and specifically in making synapses. And because of these results, we decided to invest a lot of effort in trying to understand latrophilins their functions, and their relation to synapse formation. And what I'm going to tell you today about for the rest of the talk is the results that we had in this analysis for two of the three latrophilin genes, latrophilin 2 and 3. Latrophilin 1, we haven't yet analyzed because the corresponding tools were only recently become available. And the approach we are using here, the only synapse I'm going to talk about is hippocampus, in vivo and in vitro, in various combinations. The first thing that we wanted to know is where are the latrophilins, in fact. And so we created mice that have knocked in epitopes because good antibodies were not available that were specific for different latrophilins. And we used these mice to analyze where the latrophilins were. And what you see here, is the result of such an analysis. On the left, you see a section stained for green latrophilin 2, red latrophilin 3, and DARPA as a nuclear marker. And you can see that the two different latrophilins are localized in different places of the neuron. When you analyze this in the CA1 region, quantitatively, you can see that the green latrophilin 2 is highly enriched in the stratum lacunosum moleculare. There's very little in the other synaptic strata, whereas the red latrophilin 3 is de-enriched in the stratum lacunosum moleculare, but enriched in the other synaptic strata, the stratum orients and the stratum radiatum. So these two latrophilins in the same postsynaptic CA1 neurons appear to be localized to different dendritic domains. What is interesting here is that these different synaptic strata correspond to different circuits. As many of you probably know, and as illustrated in this slide, a very simplified view of the hippocampus suggests that the inputs that flow from the entorhinal cortex to granule cells are then transmitted to CA3. Pyramidal neurons that then transmit their signals via Schaffer collaterals to CA1 neurons. At the same time, however, as shown here in this diagram in blue, there's also a direct pathway from the entorhinal cortex to the CA1 neurons. Now, as it turns out, the direct entorhinal cortical perforant pathway synapses only onto dendrites in the CA1 region in the stratum lacunosum molecular, whereas the Schaffer collateral synapses both on dendrites in the stratum orium and stratum radiatum, suggesting that latrophilin 2 and latrophilin 3 function in distinct synapses in the same CA1 neurons. This would actually imply that a neuron sorts the two different latrophilins to two different locations on its dendrites, suggesting 
that there is a sorting process in the neuron that differentiates between these two lateral finites. Obviously, we wanted to test this and we wanted to know if lateral fillings also function in synapse formation in vivo. And so we performed experiments that enable us to test this using stereotactic injections of viruses into newborn mice. And what you see here is how this is done. We first inject lentiviruses at a relatively low concentration into the CA1 region at P0. And you can see here in the light blue neurons that a few of the neurons are infected. Then after three to four weeks, as shown here, sorry, on the right side, we patch the neurons. We do either fill them with biocytin to measure their morphology and especially their spine density, or we use them for electrophysiology. And when we do the spine density measurements as shown here, in the case of mice that have a conditional deletion of latofilin 2 using delta Cre viruses as a control, we find that there is no change in spine and synapse density in the stratum orion and the radiatum, but there is a significant decrease in spine and synapse density in the stratum lacanosum moleculare. This is consistent with the localization of the latrofilin 2. We wanted to ensure that this was correct using electrophysiology. To do this, we used a strategy that is illustrated in this slide here, where you can see on the top left that we are patching a CA1 neuron and then we stimulate with different electrodes for the same neuron, either presynaptic Schaffer collateral inputs, which is the stratum radiatum stimulation, or perforant path inputs, which is the stratum lacunosum moleculare stimulation. And you can see sample traces for these experiments on the right. When we do this for the latrofilin 2 deletion, we find that the Schaffer collateral stimulation reveals an increased synaptic strength, not a decrease, maybe an increase because of some kind of compensation. Whereas the performed path reveals the, typical, reveals the typical decrease that you would expect from a loss of synapses. So we conclude from this experiment that the lutnafilin 2 deletion really does selectively affect the number of synapses and synaptic connectivity in the stratum lacunosum moleculare for the perforant path inputs. Does latofilin 3 perform a similar function in its dental domain? To address this, we performed exactly the same experiment. You see the same scheme I already showed to you, but now done in latofilin 3 conditional mice. When we do this for latrofilin-3 conditional mice, we now find that Schaffer collateral synapse densities, as illustrated here with the spine density and spine stratum orients and stratum radiatum, are significantly decreased, whereas the stratum lacunosum moleculare spine density is normal. And when we look at the input-output relations, Schaffer collateral inputs are impaired, perforant path inputs are normal. So this together documents two key points. One is that latofilin 2 and latofilin 3 are essential for subsets of synapses on the CA1 parameter neurons. And two, that they're specific for inputs that are either from the Schaffer collateral for latofilin 3 or the perforant path for latofilin 2. And this forms the basis for our thinking that latofilin's control formation and specificity of synapses of a defined subset of synapses. And obviously we would love to extend in future these experiments to other latofilins, that is latofilin 1, and to other adhesion GPCRs. In fact, in studies that I don't have time to discuss today, 
we performed similar experiments with similar results for another family of adhesion GPCRs called BIAS. So the next question then in this project was, how does it work? How, does, how do lateral fillings as GPCRs actually manage to control synapse formation in such a specific manner? After all, the, a neuron expresses probably hundreds of GPCRs. So specificity must be combined, must be arising from some degree of interactions. And so in this next project that I'm gonna discuss with you, we investigate this by looking at the importance of ligand binding. What you see here in this slide on the left is a schematic view of three mutants that we generated to address this question. One mutant has point mutations that makes it impossible for latrophilin to bind to flirts. A second mutant has a deletion of the internal small lectin-like domain that makes it impossible for latrophilin to bind tenuin. And the third mutant is a mutant that blocks the autoproteolysis of the gain domain without changing its folding. And this mutation was enabled by the structure that we obtained many years ago, making it possible for us to test the efficiency and effectiveness and importance and function of the GP of the autoproteolytic cleavage. What you see here on the right, I don't want to go into the details for reasons of time, is a confirmation that these mutants actually work. Namely, that they go to the cell surface and that they only abolish the ligand interactions that they were designed to abolish. With the GP, the gain domain mutation shown very much on the right, not affecting any function, either the surface transport or the ligand binding. So these constructs enable rescue experiments. We can now go ahead and either in culture or in vivo test whether they can rescue the phenotype of a not deletion. And we did this specifically here for latrophilin 3. And what you see here are rescue experiments in culture. And you can see here on the left that quantifications of synapse number in culture reveal as expected that the deletion of latrophilin 3 with CRE causes a loss of about 45% of synapses. This is rescued with wild type latrophilin 3, but it is not rescued, at least not efficiently, with either the tenuin or the flirt deficient, binding deficient mutant. However, it is rescued fully by the mutant in which autoproteolysis is blocked suggesting that autoproteolysis is not essential. What you see here on the right is an analysis of such rescue experiments using measurements of the mini frequency as a functional readout of synapse density. Again, you can see that there's about a 45 to 50 percent decrease in frequency upon the deletion. Wild type latrophilin rescues the ligand binding mutants, neither one of them rescues. The autoproteolysis mutant perfectly rescues. There were two surprises in these results. One was that autoproteolysis was not required. Although this is a rather superficial analysis, it suggests that at least for synapse formation, the N and this tethered agonist is probably not the mechanism by which signaling occurs. The other surprise was that deletion of binding of either one or the other ligand prevented rescue, suggesting that you needed both ligand binding sites. And this intrigued us, leading us to ask whether the binding sites for both ligands are also required for in vivo function. And so we performed in vivo rescue experiments 
using in vivo manipulations, teletactic in vivo manipulations, similar to what I described to you earlier, but instead of just injecting Cree, we now injected Cree in combination with rescue constructs. I'm only gonna show you the most important readout, which is that in this input-output measurements of sharper collateral synaptic strength, the wild type fully rescues, but the two different ligand binding mutants fail to rescue, demonstrating that it is essential to have both ligand binding sites. Now for us, <coughs> this was such a fundamental finding because it seemed to be kind of counterintuitive. Why would you need binding to two ligands instead of just one? If it was adhesion, one should be enough. We were so intrigued by that, that we felt we needed to have a test of this conclusion with a completely different method that didn't depend on electrophysiology. And so we used retrograde rabies tracing to quantify synaptic connectivity. What you see on this slide is just a description of the method. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this method. <clears throat> was developed by Ed Callaway some time ago. It's brilliant, but it's, in my opinion, only good for studying synaptic connectivity, not for functional manipulations, because the rabies virus is extremely toxic to the neurons. However, to study synaptic connectivity, it has enormous value. And the way it works is illustrated on the left. You have a series of stereotactic injections, and in the end, what you get is on the right, where you have, in this case in the hippocampus, a few starter cells. These are the cells that are initially infected. They are the ones whose input synapses you are testing. What you see then is the rabies virus retrograde propagation in green in the middle panel. In the, you can see that that rabies virus propagation is observed on both sides. As you probably know, Schaffer collaterals to 50% project to the other side, contralateral side, and 50% stays here. As a result, you get from unilateral labeling both sides inputs labeled with the rabies virus, something you cannot analyze by electrophysiology. What you can see also is that the entorhinal cortex has projections, obviously, to CA1. That is shown here on the right. But these projections are much less abundant. They are much sparser, as you can see here. So this allows for mapping of bilateral inputs to CA1 neurons and allowed us to look at the lateral function. So we did the same experiment on the left. You can just see the sample images. I'm not going to go into the detail. We quantified this, obviously. And the quantification is shown here on the right. And what you can see on the top quantification for the ypsilateral CA1, CA3, is that the CA3 input neurons that form the Schaffer collaterals are labeled dramatically less when latrofilin 3 is knocked out as you would expect. You can fully rescue that with wild type. Again, you cannot rescue with the ligand binding mutants. The same thing is observed for the contralateral CA3. So both sides depend on latrofilin 3, at least to a large extent. Whereas the entorhinal cortex is completely normal. So this result indicates that presynaptic tenuins and fluids must both bind to postsynaptic latrofilin 3 in order to form the synapses. That there's a heterophilic interaction between one postsynaptic and two presynaptic inter uh, adhesion molecules that together induce the signals that make and maintain the synapses. Now, this junction you may hesitate, maybe even earlier, I don't know, and ask, well, there is a literature that concludes that actually tenuance binding homophilically mediates synapse formation 
and cause synapse specificity. In fact, Nature published a series of papers, three papers from my colleague Li Chen Lu at Stanford, saying basically this. And they demonstrated very elegantly, but purely based on correlative data, that tenuins sort of match, and that therefore their interactions may actually form synapses. We were interested in trying to test this hypothesis mechanistically. So to test it mechanistically, we simply deleted tenuins either postsynaptically or presynaptically. And the way we did this is by using conditional knockout mice for tenuin three and four, which we were graciously, which we graciously were graciously given by Li Chen Lu. And when we did this, we found that the postsynaptic deletion of tenuin three and four together had no effect whatsoever on synapse formation onto those postsynaptically deleted neurons. Whereas the presynaptic deletion massively impaired synapse formation. And so this indicates that postsynaptic latrophilins could indeed be bona fide alive receptors or ligands, whatever way you want to turn it, for tenuins, presynaptic tenuins. And that this heterophilic adhesion complex is a great candidate for signaling that establishes synapses in the face first place. Let's go back to the main question then. Why are two ligand binding sites required for latrophilins? I don't have a definitive answer why both are required, but I would like to speculate and that is a hypothesis, this is not a fact, that there may be coincidence signaling whereby multiple ligands have to bind in order to assure specificity. What you see in this slide here is a composite of different crystal structures that illustrates in cryo-EM structures what I mean. You can see the latrophilin structure in pink. You can see that the latrophilin is bound at the same as to flirts. What I haven't told you is that flirts also bind at the same time as latrophilins to another adhesion molecule called ANC5 that I'm not going to discuss. You can also see that at the same time, tenuins bind to a different domain of latrophilins. And as a result, we have this trimeric, it's actually more than trimeric, it's multi multimeric transsynaptic complex that we believe is involved in signaling to the postsynaptic and presynaptic sites via bidirectional signals the establishment of synapses. And so the hypothesis that we are now trying to further pursue is that latrophilins direct the specificity of synaptic connections by coincidence detection of two ligands tenuins and flirts in an isoform specific manner. Let me move on and come to the last part of my discussion with you today, which regards how latrophilins might signal. And obviously, being GPCRs, the question arises, is it the GPCR signaling that mediates latrophilin function? Are they actually really GPCRs? Or are they adhesion molecules with the vestiges of a GPCR domain that is really not functional? And we addressed this question in unpublished studies, again using rescue experiments. In this case, there are again three specific mutants as shown here. There is one mutant that has no transmembrane regions whatsoever, just a GPI anchor, but all the adhesion domains. There's another mutant that is the most specific, where we block G protein and arrestin binding by inserting T4 lysozymes into the third cytoplasmic loop. This is a trick that many GPCR researchers are using to block interactions of a GPCR with G proteins and arrestins. Finally, 
we use the third mutant that truncates the cyto long cytoplasmic tail. It does not block G protein signaling, but it does block other potential interactions via the cytoplasmic tail. I'm not going to give you the background information, just please trust me. These mutants are expressed on the neuronal cell surface and in cell aggregation assays. They are not significantly impaired. In other words, they bind to their ligands and transsynaptically makes sense because the ligand binding sites are not changed. So with these mutants then, the first question that we can ask is whether G latophilins actually have any GPCR-like activity. Because with the T4L insertion mutant, we have a mutant that based on the literature should block that activity. So we tested this using very simple assays in HEC293 cells. And specifically, we tested this one mutant that I mentioned already, the T4 ligase mutant, because that's the most specific. We measured two different things, cyclic AMP levels and protein kinase A activity. The way we did this is shown here is that we transfected the HEC293 cells with either G alpha S or with G alpha S and PDE 7B. PDE 7B is a phosphodiesterase that destroys cyclic AMP and thus should abolish all signals as a control. When we do that and we measure the cyclic AMP levels as a function of latrophilin 2, you can see that in the absence of PDE7, it's increased. But PDE7 obviously blocks it. When we do the same thing for the mutant insertion mutants, it blocks the increase in cyclic AMP. When we measure the protein kinase A activity using a phosphor substrate, we find the same pattern. For PDE7B actually doesn't completely block the activity, but significantly blocks it. The mutant significantly blocks GPCR activity as based on this assay. We did the same experiments for latofilin 3 with the same results. So clearly, with these mutants, we thus have a tool that enable testing the role of GPCR signal and latofilin function. Because these experiments establish that at least in principle, latofilins can function as GPCRs. So we performed the usual rescue experiments. If we look at synapse density, as shown here, all three mutants that are illustrated to you, including the T4L in insertion mutant, block rescue. When we look at mini frequency as a proxy of synapse numbers, same thing. Suggesting, yes, you do need transduction of a signal via the GPCR moiety. And in addition, these experiments indicate that you also need some other activity of the long cytoplasmic tail. What about in vivo? In vivo, we completely focused on the T4L mutation because that is the in vivo experiments are actually incredibly labor intensive. They take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and you can't just do all these mutants. And so in focusing on the T4L insertion, we looked at, again, physiology in acute slices using the same manipulations that I explained to you earlier for the other rescue experiments. When we did this for latrophilin 2, and we measured Schaffer collateral stimulation, we found as expected that the Cre deletion had no effect, and that addition of latrophilin 2 on top of Cre, either wild type or mutant, had no effect either. When we did the perforant path stimulation, we found, again as expected, that the deletion severely impaired synaptic transmission. This was rescued by wild type, but not 
by the T4L mutation that blocks G protein coupling. So this experiment shows that in the synapses, there is not only specificity, but there's also specificity of rescue. And that apparently G protein coupling is essential. GPCR activity is essential. What about latrophilin 3? We did the same experiment for latrophilin 3. In the Schaffer collateral, now the Cree deletion causes a massive impairment in, um, <clears throat> in, in the Schaffer collateral connectivity that was largely rescued by the wild type, but not at all by the mutant. Again, if you look at perfund path, as you would expect, there's no effect whatsoever in either way. So these experiments are really, for us at least, intriguing because they establish in vivo that you do need latrophilin GPCR activity in order for latrophilin to organize synapses. It means, in other words, the possibility that a general principle in biology, GPCR signaling, is adapted in this case for one specific purpose, which is postsynaptic signaling for synapse formation. We were again motivated to actually test this further using rabies virus tracing to confirm these results independently. As shown here, we used the same approach that I already illustrated to you earlier, as here schematically shown in A, sample images in B. This is my last data slide. And you can see that in the summary on the right, that again, there's this decrease in synaptic connectivity with the Cree in the ipsilateral CA3 region and the contralateral CA3 region. This is fully rescued with wild type, but not with the T4L mutant. There's no effect on enterocortex reactivity. Confirming not only the specificity of latrophilin 3 as all before, but more importantly, the necess necessity of GPCR signaling. So in other words, what these experiments thus establish is that latrophilins function indeed as GPCRs. And in wrapping up my presentation, this is the summary of what I've tried to tell you, which is, the latrophilins, at least latrophilin 2 and 3, function by an activation or modulation of GPCR activity by ligands, tenurins and fluids, presumably, that is then translated into synapse formation. And that is the fundamental program that we are trying to now elucidate further mechanistically in order to understand the cell biology of synapse formation. And in closing, I would like to acknowledge the most important contributors of this work, Richard Sando, who is gonna start his own lab at Vanderbilt University in a couple of months, did the most recent studies together with Tian Zhang and Shu Chen Zhang, the project was initiated in my lab originally by Anthony Bucar and Garrett Anderson, who now have their own labs in different places. And Shalika Cornelius was an important contributor to some of the studies. I have had the luck and fortune to have wonderful collaborators, especially in Demet Arc, with whom we collaborate on the structure of biology of these complexes, as I tried to describe to you. And finally, let me acknowledge, maybe most importantly, that none of this work would be possible without support from NIMH and from HHMI. Thank you very much. I'm at the end of my presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you, thank you so much.
Professor Zutoff as I uh, just come back on live. So there are a few questions. One had to do with, uh, with the conditional knockouts. Do they show deficits in hippocampal or dependent behaviours? Are there behavioural correlates to some of the synaptic changes you've shown? Given the hippocampus and its formations are so fundamental to many of the behaviours that we test across the range of disorders. Yes, of course they are. I haven't shown these data because I think they're so obvious. I mean, <laughs> come on. Do you mess with okay. the hippocampus? If you're missing okay. hippocampus synapses, you've got problems. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Another one about when the knocking out I mean, latrophilins induces embryonic lethality. Do, do you know? Yes, so that's an important question. Yes. So there's three latrophilins. Only one induces embryonic lethality and that is latrophilin 2. It induces embryonic lethality because latrophilins also have a non-neuronal function. During development, they're essential for lateral, for polar, polar, for lateral polarity, planar polarity. And so what happens is that the heart development doesn't work well. Right. And so that is a common, actually, all of these adhesion molecules, maybe with the exception of neurexins, have non-neuronal functions as well, tenurins, floats, and so on. Yeah. So there's then a series of questions about whether anyone has demonstrated uh, latrophilin abnormalities in association with any of the disease states that we also associate with synaptic changes in particular uh, within hippocampus. Neurodegenerative diseases, you mentioned earlier, like Alzheimer's or major neuropsychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. Has, it, has anyone ever shown any correlation between the two? Yes, a great question. Of course, one of the motivations for all of our work is that we would love to find ways of helping understanding these very important disorders. And in fact, we have multiple projects on these disorders, especially for neurexins, which I haven't discussed today because there are so many genetic links. For latrophilins, it turns out that latrophilin-3 is probably the best established GWAS associated link to um, ADHD, to attention deficit hyperactivity yeah. disorder. Yeah. And it turns out that there is a polymorphism in an enhancer that changes the expression of latrophilin 3 dramatically. And that is very strongly associated with the risk for the ADHD. Right. And we would be very interested in trying to understand how that works. But we haven't actually been able to do that because of funding. <laughs> funding. Funding. Yeah. Imagine funding being a problem. Imagine we're a Nobel laureate and funding's a problem. Funding <laughs> we are struggling with some basic problem. science funding in Australia at the moment. Um, funding is a huge problem. Yeah. I'm sure funding. you're going to have a COVID-19 variant that attracts funding to this particular area. Maybe COVID-19 will affect it. I say that in part because uh, one question relates to the classic synaptic systems you mentioned. Uh, the other being, of course, immune modulators of signaling in these particular areas uh, where GPCR seem to play a role in both. Uh, are there other, do you think, uh, parallels between the two systems? I think actually there are, well, first of all, the immune system, the innate immune system plays a major role in the brain. And that's only now slowly coming to the attention of us neuroscientists, but it's clearly very important. Um, I think the connection of the immunologic synapse or the relationship or the similarity of the immunologic synapse to um, uh, neuronal synapse is actually not that close. There are some similarities in terms of the vesicular machinery, which we have used to work on, but no longer work on. And there are some similarities in that you need adhesion, but otherwise they're very, very different. Um, okay, so I'm being asked by the uh, organizers to move on, but there's a series of questions. We don't often have a Nobel Prize winner for the afternoon to discuss these issues. Um, do you think in mature synapses, as the thing from the developing brain, that there may be the uh, option, uh, ways or options for modulating latrophilin function to actually enhance connection patterns or in some way other may be derived towards clinical applications, particularly where synapses have been lost, I suppose. Yeah, great question. Again, 
I think that would be, that is a very exciting possibility that offers itself because you know, they persist throughout life. They're there, they don't go away once the synapse is formed. And there's no reason why they wouldn't be modulated. They are, for example, extensively alternatively spliced. That may be one way of modulation. In addition to that, they're phosphorylated. There's all kinds of modulation. I would be very surprised if they couldn't, wouldn't be involved in plasticity. And I could easily imagine that drugs targeting latrophilins might have a powerful effect on the brain. The question is only what type of effect. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the ADHD link, it seems as though there is a loss, a decrease in levels that is associated with ADHD. Right. Suggesting that if there was a way to specifically increase function, that this might be beneficial. So just on the not... splicing you mentioned earlier, there was a question about whether there is there any evidence for alternative splicing of latrophilins increasing the functional, functional heterogeneity and specificity? So there definitely is alternative splicing. I don't know whether it's specific yet because those kinds of experiments are actually not that straightforward to do. To do, yeah. Um, but um, there is definitely alternative splicing and there are promising indications that some of the alternative splicing is functionally relevant. That it changes ligand binding or GPCR activity. Okay, and as one final question, perhaps the most important one. As a Nobel laureate, one, what one piece of advice would you have for early and mid-career researchers? In Australia, we have the challenging situation of funding you mentioned and of you know, an issue about encouraging people into these complex areas of science, particularly neuroscience, as distinct from some um, other easier path. So given the success that you've had in your life, what's the best advice to those who are on this path? Well, the best advice I can only give, I can give is to not be timid. What I mean with that is if you decide to become a scientist, which is a risk, undoubtedly, the Fact is, especially as a medical doctor, there's a much easier life out there and better paid too. Yes. Um, a well-paid, secure career is elsewhere, yes. <laughs> so if you're going to go that path, you might as well engage in a risk. You might as well do something bold and not sort of go on with the same old path. At any given time, there's a major fashion that permeates everything. Right now, it's circuits. Everybody works on systems neuroscience and circuits in neuroscience. There's nothing bold about working on that. On the other side, right now, mechanistic neuroscience has very few followers. So that is, I think, where one can be bold and do really new stuff. And that is my advice. Do something that other people don't do and um, don't be timid. Trust yourself. Well, I think on that piece of sage advice, it's incredibly helpful you say that. I mean, well, I might say one of the goals here at the Brain and Mind Center is to be large enough and secure enough that people can do novel things, that they actually can take risks. And we're lucky within the context of the University of Sydney that it's made this large investment in this multidisciplinary sets of uh, science related projects. So I just say thank you so much for your time this afternoon, Thomas. It's been really a pleasure to learn about from my own point of view some things that we know barely anything about and to have it so clearly presented. So thank you very much. We hope you uh, stay safe in the current world as it is and are able to continue your work for many more years to come. Thank you so much I for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And we'll have thank the you can see that you can see that you can see you just have to appreciate the number of applause here from the number of participants. Thank you so much.